In this session, we're going to dive a bit deeper into an example of a feminist judgment so that we can see a worked example of what it looks like to take an existing judgment and rewrite it from a feminist perspective. And then finally, I'm going to give an overview of the book and so you can see how your particular contribution fits into the whole. So the first thing that Casey and I wanted to do is to work through an illustrative example of a feminist judgment. And we chose one from the Australian Feminist Judgment Project, which deals with all kinds of law, family law, criminal law, civil law, et cetera. We chose one from the criminal law section. It's the case of Takato and the Queen. Some of you have had a chance to read that feminist judgment and have sent us comments on why you found it to be feminist. Others of you just in the um, busyness of life may not have had a chance to yet read that judgment um, and you might choose to read it after the session. It's quite brief. It's only seven pages long, so it's quite a, a useful tool. But just for those who haven't had a chance to read it, I'll just give you a very quick introduction to what the case is about. As I said, it's from the Australian jurisdiction and it's a criminal law case. It turns on the defendant, Joanne Takato, was apprehended with an object in her purse, which was considered to be a weapon. And that was a formaldehyde spray, a self-defence spray, you know, a rape spray. Um, she had that, as the judgment revealed, because she had been previously um, attacked in her own home and as a way to try and make herself feel safer and more prepared in the world, she had to... Um, taken to carrying around this spray in her purse. And several years after that attack, she was apprehended by police officers in Sydney. It was actually a case of mistaken identity. They, they apprehended her to ask her questions um, and it turned out she was the wrong person. But in that encounter, they searched her bag and they found the spray and then they charged her with a criminal offence under the Firearms Act of 1989 um, for possessing an unlawful weapon without a reasonable or a lawful excuse. After she was convicted of that crime, she appealed. The case went all the way up to Australia's highest appellate court, which is the High Court of Australia. And the, the High Court decided that she was, in fact, guilty because she was possessing a weapon without a lawful and reasonable excuse. And so her conviction was upheld. We thought it was a really interesting example to look at because it's not about sexual violence, it's about the scope of certain defences, and because we thought it was an interesting illustrative example of how gender can be relevant in all different ways that we may not at first blush see. So the rewritten judgment is written by um, Cross and Alexander, and in it they actually find that her conviction should be overturned and that she should be acquitted. So Casey and I wanted to just, just have a brief chat about why this rewritten judgment by Cross and Alexander can be considered feminist. And also, why is it still a judgment? Why does it still read as a plausible legal decision? So Casey, what was your first thought as why it is feminist? One of the things that really, I think, jumps out most significantly in terms of why this is still a feminist judgment is that it positions the defendant in her social context. It takes seriously her, her lived experience as a member of a vulnerable group, that being as a woman, and it takes seriously her lived experience as someone who has experienced attack. And, and not just attack, but actually the fact that the attack that had happened in her life was a home invasion. So that, that public-private dichotomy that is so uh, really essential to feminist work, that particular understanding um, of um, how women have experienced violence um, and the fact that she is someone who had had violence um, in the home uh, is really quite significant. Um, so that's a significant piece. Um, the other piece is um, that certainly um, our contributors made some, I think, really insightful points about the way in which the judgment uh, is feminist. So, for example, um, Winifred Nagaya, who was one of the participants um, in our last session, I think summarised the issue really well. 
The court looked at the experience of the accused, not just as a member of a social group, women, particularly vulnerable to violence and other such groups, including the elderly, children, ethnic minorities and homosexuals, but that she had personally experienced a threat of violence in her own home. The end result was a change in the status of the accused from being an object to having agency before the law. Um, or as contributor uh, Cassandra Mungway, who's part of today's session said, the judgment acknowledges experiences more typical of women than of men when addressing threats to safety. For example, carrying keys between their knuckles, rape alarms, etc. For women, these protective measures are reasonable. Thanks, Casey. So it's feminist in substance because when considering what was reasonable and what is lawful, it's looking at it from her standpoint as a member of a social group being women that is more um, uh, vulnerable to particular forms of violence and as a particular person who in her lived experience has been attacked in her home. The other way that Casey and I thought the judgment was quite feminist is in its presentation of the facts. That is, what does it start with when it is saying what is the factual context for this case? You might notice that the rewritten feminist judgment begins with what is most important to the accused. That is the fact that she was attacked in her own home. And so it's orienting us to see the world from her perspective, whereas the real judgment, the high court one, starts with what's most important from the law's perspective, which is the fact that she was carrying the firearm. Let me read you just the first two sentences of both judgments so you can see how the chronological facts, it's the same facts, but they're arranged in a different order and it's uh, ships who we sympathise with. So this is the real high court judgment. It starts with what's most relevant to the law which is at about 12.15pm on 26th of March 1992, the appellant, Mrs Joanne Takato, was walking in Railway Street, Liverpool, Sydney. She was approached by police officers. The officers searched her possessions. In her handbag, they found a pressurised canister of formaldehyde. An analyst's report subsequently certified that the spray canister, when discharged, produced a clear liquid with a pungent odour. And it goes on to say that the officers charged her with an offence under Section 545E of the Firearms Act, starting with what's relevant to the law. Contrast that, though, with the feminist judgment. It begins as follows. One night, Joanne Takaito and her husband returned home to find an intruder in the process of breaking into their house. On being disturbed in this purpose, the intruder attempted to strike Mrs Takaito. Although no harm came to her on this occasion, Mr Kaito was sufficiently disturbed by the incident to seek to take precautions against a future attack. On making inquiries, she was sold a self-defence spray in a hotel. She carried this spray for two years, happily without needing it, until she was stopped and searched in Liverpool, Sydney, on the 26th of March, 1992. And Casey and I thought that was, was really interesting how the facts are there in both judgments, but in the feminist judgment, they choose to start with her lived experience that was formative to her, the one that made her feel attacked in the world, and the one where she felt that the way to have agency was to be carrying around a self-defence spray. So we think that's interesting for you to consider when you're being a bit playful with how you rearrange the facts in your judgment. That's a, that's a really important emphasis, Rose, and I think that answers one of the questions that we received um, from, from Emma about the extent to which there's flexibility about how the facts are framed and, in fact, that is a really significant contribution. We're going to turn in a moment to why this judgment still reads as feminist, but I did want to raise one particular critique or concern that has been raised by contributors, and I think it's also uh, foreshadowed in the, the judgment itself. And there is certainly a concern that potentially reading the law this way forever renders women victims. And there's a tension there in the sense of, on one hand, wanting to provide some kind of protection to women as a class, but that there might be some kind of gendered consequences that are also problematic in forever imagining women as subjects or objects of violence. And really the response to that is that's the power and importance of having reflections. Um, and in, in our project, um, 
will be a little bit distinct to other projects in that the reflection will be on the bundle of, of judgments in a particular situation and working through some of these issues that feminist uh, feminists do grapple with in terms of um, gendered responses to the law and the way in which we might reimagine law from a feminist perspective isn't always going to be simple uh, and there are going to be differences of, of opinion. Mm. Mm. And that we can explore those both in the judgment and in the reflection. Exactly. And in the last two minutes of this session, Casey and I wanted to sort of speak about, we've talked about why it can be considered a feminist text, this rewritten seven-page judgment, but why is it still a judgment, Casey? Great question, Rose. Uh, so why is it still a judgment? Well, I think it's fairly obvious to those of us who are used to reading judgments that it has the look and feel of a judgment. Um, it relies on legal authorities. Of course, in the jurisdiction that we're talking about in Australia, that the, the legal authorities are, are statute and um, precedence, the common law. But in the ICC, it would be the Rome statute. But the point is the same. Judges are constrained uh, by the law and must decide according to the law. Did you have anything to add, Rose, in terms of... Yeah, how this yeah. apart from the reliance on legal authorities, another thing that you and I were talking about is it has some of the genre features that are inherent to a judgment. It sets out what are the facts. It sets out what is the offence charge. It's quite authoritative in its tone. That is to say the judges aren't necessarily needing to cite everybody else under the sun for their opinion. They just apply the law and give their opinion because they have the authority to do so. It's quite measured, meaning that although it does decide for one party or the other, in this case, it decides for Mr Kaito, it still considers counter-arguments. In this case, it considers the counter-argument that if we allow people to carry around uh, formaldehyde spray in their purse, is it going to make the streets unsafe by allowing gangs to be carrying knives, guns, more serious weapons? So it does turn its mind to the counter-arguments as well. And ultimately, it has a feature that all judgments need to have, which is it has to make a decision. Unlike some academic texts, it can't end with, well, this is very complicated, but at least we've had a look at the issue and exposed lots of queries. It does actually have to make a decision for one of the parties. In this case, they decided for the appellant and they decided to overturn her conviction. Whatever it is, a rewritten judgment has to land on a finding of fact or a finding of law or a finding of procedure. And so that's also an important feature. So... That little worked example, we hope, gives you some food for thought and you're welcome to read that rewritten judgment. As we said, it's seven pages. It's not overly long, but it can be useful to see a worked example of a feminist judgment. What I wanted to do now is spend about um, a little bit less than 10 minutes giving an overview of the shape of the book as a whole. And so this is so that you can understand how your important contribution fit into the project as a whole. I hope you can all see my slides, is that right? Fantastic. So we've heard a bit about the Bemba case from the Central African Republic already, and you might recognise that this is the Bemba trial chamber that convicted Jean-Pierre Bemba. Um, that conviction was overturned on appeal. We wanted to foreground this image so that you can start thinking now about the ICC and what are the judgments that we're looking at and where is your contribution going to fit? So to give you a sense of the structure of the book, it's a three-act um, play, if you will. There'll be part one is an introduction section. That part will explain the motivation for the book. It will explain how we assembled this incredible crew of contributors and reflection writers. And it will explain what the feminist judgment method has been so far and where we want to take that method in this book. Then the next section, which is really the climax of the book, is the rewritten feminist judgment and the reflections. This is where all of your contributions really are going to be coming in. Um, I'll give you a sense about how that middle part is structured, <clears throat> but for this slide, let me just say that this is really going to be the heart of the book. This is going to be the longest section of the book. And this is where we're going to start to see all of your contributions. And then finally, there's a short conclusion section, which wraps up what the book has sought to achieve, what were some of the main themes that came out, what were some of the surprises, and what are the tensions? Okay, let's focus on this red bit, the middle bit of the book, which is the judgments. 
how is that going to be structured? Well, we have selected eight different ICC situations. That's the situation in Afghanistan, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Central African Republic, Cote d'Ivoire, Mali, the Myanmar Bangladesh situation, the Sudan, and Uganda. Now, as you know, this is an every ICC situation, but the book is um, already huge. This is an enormous undertaking with um, uh, around about 50 contributors. And so what we've had to do is not cover every single case and situation, but instead a good range, a good cross-section. <coughs> Some of the ways that this is a cross-section is that, as you'll notice, it's outside of Africa. As you know, the ICC has been subjected to criticism, some of it justified, that it's too Africa-focused. What we're trying to do is we've selected a number of African case studies, but we've also got some from Asia. And we've also included some situations where the alleged perpetrators are from Western powers, such as the Afghanistan situation. Another way that this is at least a broad cross-section is that we look at proceedings at different stages. Some of these situations are still very early on. There are no cases yet brought, such as Afghanistan or Myanmar. Others are at quite an advanced stage where there have been several trials, some convictions and even some reparations, such as the Democratic Republic of Congo. We've also selected these case studies because it allows us to explore a big range of different types of issues some of them are to do with sexual violence, but it's also to do with crimes that are on their face gender neutral, such as pillage or the recruitment of child soldiers. But we've also included cases and situations where we can go beyond crimes and look at issues of admissibility of evidence, modes of liability, state cooperation, defences, complementarity, lots of different issues in order to really push open the thinking of what it means to have a gender or a feminist lens in international criminal law. So as I said, there's these eight different situations. Let me show you just how a particular situation will be structured. So just as an illustrative example, I've chosen the one in Uganda, just to give you a sense of what the actual shape of that section of the book will look like. Okay, so for any situation, in this case, Uganda, there'll be a short overview that the editors will write where it just introduces what is this conflict about? How did it get to the ICC? For example, was it a Security Council referral? How else did it get there? Roughly how many cases has been brought? And then there are going to be the rewritten judgments. And as we flagged already, no one is being asked to rewrite a full ICC decision on the guilt or innocence of the accused, which would be several thousands of pages. Instead, each person is focusing on one particular issue of law, procedure or fact. So, for example, um, in the Uganda case, they're all to do with um, Ongwen. Uh, Chris Dolan is going to be looking at a procedural decision in which the Victims Council asked permission at trial to lead evidence of male testimony of sexual violence and the trial chamber said no. We are not going to hear that evidence of male testimony of sexual violence. Sophia Rigney, a former defence counsel at the ICTY, now an academic, is going to be looking at Ongwen's defences. He claimed that he is not guilty because he was um, experiencing duress and or mental incapacitation at the time. And she was, she's going to be looking at those decisions from a feminist perspective. I'm going to be working with Tony Kirabira, who is a Ugandan scholar and someone that spent some time at the ICC. We are going to be looking at the way that the Ongwen trial judgment looked at the allegations of forced pregnancy. And we're also going to be highlighting some other violations of reproductive autonomy, such as forced maternity, that we think weren't fully considered in the judgment. Kate and Alexandra are going to be looking at gender persecution. Some of you might know that there are no charges of gender persecution in the Ongwen case, but in this rewritten judgment, some of the facts are being recharacterized under the crime against humanity of persecution on gender grounds. 
Winnie Nayaga Korobaika, who is a Ugandan judge who's part of this project, is going to be looking at the sentencing decision. She's going to be thinking about the way that a particular type of victim, that is children who were born as a result of rape, factor in that sentencing decision. And her aim is to make those um, victims more prominent and that they're and more rights bearers. And finally, Milena Scenario is going to be also looking at the sentencing judgment with a particular attention to the mitigating factors. That is, she is going to be thinking about how the trial chamber could have thought about Ong Wen's difficult past as being a former child soldier himself and how that impacted on his sentence. Closing off this situation, there'll be a reflection by Melanie O'Brien. And let me just say a word about what these reflections include. The reflection is a chance to look back and critically engage with all of the feminist judgments. The author, in this case, Melanie, will be pulling out what have we learned as a result of the different way that the facts and the law were talked about in the rereading judgments. And it's also a chance for the reflector to think about, is there anything missed? Could the judgments have been more intersectional? Is there an interesting tension in the way that they present vulnerability? Any other kind of critical comment that needs to be brought out? The way chronologically that they'll be written, of course, is that the contributors of the rewritten judgments produce them, and then the person writing the reflection has a chance to read all of those rewritten judgments and produce their reflection. We have been in talks with Cambridge University Press about this book. Um, we are yet to have a final decision but it's looking very positive. Our interaction has been with the editors of the Feminist Judgments series, and they don't yet have in that Cambridge Feminist Judgments series an international criminal court book. They love the idea of this book. They thought it was very timely, very exciting. Um, so there's certainly an appetite there. And one of the things that those editors of that um, series wanted to see is a little bit more detail about who all the contributors are. And thanks to these workshops, we're now in a position to provide that information. And of course, we'll be keeping you updated with where we are with the publisher. But we, we um, are pretty optimistic that that's who we'll be going with. So as I said, there's going to be these eight different situations. We have almost finalised who is writing what chapter. And in the next week or so, we're going to have a look at our spreadsheet, make sure we've got everything covered off, make sure that there's a good balance, and then we'll be giving you um, much more detailed direction about where you'll be going. And as you can imagine, we've done quite a lot of thinking about how to make sure the different judgments aren't duplicative and do cover a range of different topics. And so we'll be asking that once we have made those final decisions, that you'll be so kind as to proceed with the decision that you've been allocated. And so that that way we can make sure that this whole thing is curated in a way that is balanced and doesn't repeat itself. And the end result will be a book that we hope will really push and blow open the concept of what it means to apply feminist judging in the ICC.